Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. I'm your host, Greg Myers. And on today's show, we have Shai Gabe, the co-founder and CEO of Trust Me. So welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for being here. Let's go ahead and dive in, if you don't mind. Tell our audience a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, a few things like that. Okay, cool. So my name is Shai Gabe. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Trust Me. Came from a long experience in cybersecurity, but we'll cover that probably later. Grew up in a small uh, town north to Tel Aviv, like one hour north to that, and moved to the U.S. almost one and two months ago. So, yeah, that's worth it about myself. Okay, great. Well, let's go ahead and talk about the company. So tell our audience what Trust Me does. So Trust Me is a B2B payment security platform. Basically, what we do, we are protecting those payments. We discovered that there is a lot of problems in B2B payment. When we started a company, the first thing that we did, we tried to understand what's happening in the payment landscape. And we learned at first there was a lot of disruption when speaking about B2C side. Think about how you're doing your own personal payment. Everything evolves. Everything becomes super easy, fast, and secure. But take that experience and go to the other side, to corporate finance, to B2B side, how you pay your own vendors. That's not the same experience, right? It's a totally different area with a lot of complexity, a lot of manual work. And in fact, because of that, it's become the most vulnerable attack surface exists today. So we saw that there is a lot of payment fraud as a very big issue, but because of those complexity, also a lot of payment mistakes. And 1% to 3% of the entire payment are mistakes. So that's why we went after that area. And basically what Trustme does, we are a SaaS solution that connect to the end-to-end of the B2B payment flows. And we are basically connecting the dots for you. So the B2B payment is complex because first, it's involved a lot of different people inside and outside the organization. But then you have a lot of different systems procurement, portals, ERPs, the parent itself. But each one of them are siloed and at the end manual validate. So what we are doing, we're connecting those dots and making sure that each payment go to the right place at the right time with the right amount. So eliminate payment fraud, internal or external, but also those payment mistakes. Okay. So within B2B payments, are there specific verticals you focus on? So most of our customers today are in five sectors, but we are mostly focused on where there are big supply chain and high volume of payment and scale. But if you ask the specific vectors, we are more focused on pharmaceutical, manufacturing, retail hospitality, tech, and insurance. That's the five. Okay. And when did the company start? So we founded the company in November 21, so almost three years ago. Okay. Okay. And how's it going so far? Going, going. Yeah, we're protecting big companies in the U.S. Most of our customers are Fortune 500 organization, customers like Colgate, CNA, Chipotle, and others. At scale, I'm going to say that only last year, we processed around $185 billion of dollars for our customers. And from that, we were able to detect and prevent something like 5 billion of payment mistakes. More than 50% were duplicate invoices, although so different type of typos, currencies, and so on. And more than 500 of millions of fraud. And till today, zero false positive. Wow. Okay. So how much of it is fraud, like bad actors versus just mistakes because humans are so involved? So I'm going to say say on the fraud element, big portion is criminal, cyber criminals. It's become a very good market for them. When I started my career, especially at the bank, we saw those things. And most of the time, people were relying on manual controls and a lot of awareness and education. Basically, you will train your team to know if someone send you an email with spelling mistakes or stuff like that, you'll know that probably it's a scammer that try to take your money, right? Right. right. But the evolution of the technology and, you know, think about Gen AI and deep fake and all that, that created new tools for the attacker that they can really leverage at scale. And still most of the customers or most of the organization today are still relying on the same manual controls and processes and education. But the new attacks, you won't be able to detect that. It's not working anymore. Okay. So you said SaaS model. So maybe walk us through kind of what the pricing model looks like. 
Yeah, so I mentioned that we are a platform. We are not doing only payment security. We started in the payment security because the step that we saw that everyone has a problem, that's our way to start the process. We also believe that at the end of the day, organizations need to have a solution that will be very easy to deploy, but also easy to use. And more to that, not changing the way that you do your business. So for us, our mission was defined based on that. We believe that our mission is secure and payment seamless. So that's what we start with. But then we saw that, again, like speaking in the beginning, the landscape of payment involves a lot on the B2C side. Why not to do the similarity to those things in the B2B side? So on top of those payment security models, that, that's our core functionality, we have other models that are focused on other events, like SOX compliance, like payment flow that is focused more on the efficiency of the payment cycle and also on the payment mistakes. Then we have our secure vendor onboarding. We have a dedicated use case also for claim for. It's a different type of scenario, but still very similar. And also continuous life cycles of your vendors and suppliers. So our pricing is compromised based on three uh, parameters. That is mostly volume, the amount of vendor that you have, you're working, how many transactions you're doing, and what's the total sum. And on top of that, which models you're using. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. And sort of how do you go to market? Do you have a direct sales team? Do you work through partner channels? How do you go to market? So I'm going to say all of the above, but yeah, most of that, again, early stage company. So we're mostly going direct and doing different events and different conferences and different activities like that. But we're also working with a few channels and partners as well. Okay. Okay. Well, what would you say differentiates you from your competitors out there? Yeah. So that's a great question. And you know, when we started a company, we invest a lot in really understanding how funds people think, what they have today and so on. So we, we saw different type of own solutions. And in addition to the manual controls and processes, that that's a common thing. And today I'm going to say that most of our competition is the status quo, meaning there are solutions that can really solve the problem and there are not manual controls or processes. But we also saw different type of things that organization do really do. Like, for example, bank account validation. So we saw a lot of cases that basically what they do, they ask for different services like Gaia and so on, that basically you'll verify that that's a legitimate bank account. And when we started the company, we also thought to do something like that. But then we realized that there are two main problems with that approach. First, no one has all the data, meaning from coverage perspective, it's very hard to get all those bank details and so on. Second, it's considered sensitive information that you cannot share. So, and the banks are not sharing this information. So it's really how to have a very big coverage and dynamic and um, updated one. Now, the other problem with that, we learned that it's not effective. It's not really a security mechanism. It's like more checkbox in the compliance process. And why is that? We saw only last year, thousands of cases, that basically what happened is that when the attacker compromised your suppliers, they went after their finance people. They found a lot of documents that they leveraged to pass the KYC of the bank and open a legitimate bank account on their behalf. So then even if you will do bank account validation, it's legitimate account. What other result you can expect that? So that's one type of solution that we saw. Of course, we saw different companies using email security, of course, but email security cannot solve the problem as well. Email security focus more on the maliciousness. They try to detect ransomware, different attack, phishing scam that try to collect your information and so on. But when the attacker compromises your supplier and they just try to ask you to change the bank details, there's nothing malicious there. So they're not really designed in that way. And we also saw different type of uh, solution that's focused not only on the ERP, for example when they have a change there. But again, they are missing the context. So we didn't find, and I think that that's the biggest advantage of Trust Me, is that we are basically connecting to the entire chain. We see everything that's going on and being able to really understand what happened and what's not. That's make us super accurate and that's why we don't have false positive. But also that's what make us very easy to deploy, easy to use and streamline. Okay. And you said, so... Just kind of trying to understand you're a platform, mainly large businesses. Is there a reason? Is it just a timing thing that you haven't focused on, say, medium and small businesses? Because even medium and small businesses have a lot of vendors and have to pay. There's a lot of B2B transactions. So just curious why you started at you know, the big merchant side. Also great question. And I must say that when we started a company, we at the beginning thought that we will go to SMB or SME. But then when we expand in our market validation, we learn that when the company become bigger, the problem become much worse. And you know, the attacker, they are going after the big parts. They try not to demolish the organization that they attack. 
because they want to come back and back and so on. So think about it like that. Where are they targeting their effort? Where they can steal more money. So that's part of the reason. Second, again, part of what we try to build is the trust network as well. When you go to the big uh, companies, they have much bigger supply chain and so on. So our data set become much more rich. Gotcha. That makes sense. So as you know, payments, fintech, big industry, a lot of moving parts, a lot of change. Where do you see the industry headed? And obviously you can answer this in the context of what you do, but where do you see the industry headed in the next, say, maybe three to five years? So look, I think that a couple of areas to discuss here. First, we're in an area that everyone wants to do something with AI. Right. Every conference that you'll go, every conversation that you'll do, someone is speaking about Gen AI, what we can do with that. So I think that in the next few years, we'll see a lot of experiments, what can be achieved with using those tools. And I'm going to say that there are a lot of things that today are really highly manual and can be automated using those technologies. But it's going to be more like co-pilot or decision supportive. Those tools not need to uh, replace people. They need to enrich their capabilities and help them to do what they're doing today in much better, better efficient, much better accuracy. And like what we're doing, fighting bad AI with good AI, right? So that's one aspect of that. And I think that's what you will see in the next few years because adoption is not something that's happening in a moment. Especially in the finance area, people are really keen on their processes and accuracy is a big part of that. They really want to see that it's working, to trust that it's working. Later on, I think that a lot of things will start to really change. The way that we're doing business, I believe, will change. You know, B2B didn't change for a long time. But the way that we do payment today, it's still more of the, the same. There are a lot of checks, a lot of wires, and a lot of ACH. So I'm sure that that will be also a big area that will be started in the future, meaning there will be much better solution or easiest solution to send money, and that's going to change as well. But at the end of the day, and that's why we are doing what we are doing, I believe that solution ne- or companies need to start to evolve and use in technology that can really help their bottlenecks and really use case that they have today. You know, when I was at the bank, I did a lot of innovation. And one of the areas that I was really experiment is all, always new technologies. But one of the things that I learned is that technology needs to solve specific business case. And just to experiment different technology, if you don't really know what exactly what you're go- trying to solve, that's not the way to go. Okay. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you. So it's a good segue into what you were just talking about. So tell us about your career journey, sort of where you started and how you got to founding the company. So I was always a curious child, I'm going to say. When I was a kid, I really tried to disassemble electronics and stuff like that. I can tell you when I was really young, my father didn't appreciate it because I only break things. I didn't know how to assemble it back. Later on, when I was uh, around 13, I started working. When I was 18, I went to the military. I spent eight years in intelligence corps, playing a lot of offensive. And then I realized that there was a much bigger challenge. And it will be, will be playing defense, not offense. So I thought, what will be the most target organization? Probably a bank. So I joined a bank and been there for eight years doing defense. Down this period of time, I worked with a lot of early stage companies and did a lot of innovation. So at, at one point, and I realized that that's my passion. I wanted to solve business problems using technology. But at that point, I also felt like in order to build a company, I'm missing some skills because till then I did some technology roles, leadership roles, but never did anything around business. And more to that, to work with a, with a startup from the side, like being a customer, it's not like being in a startup. So I basically decided that I need to learn how to do it first. So I was on the CISO, crossed the line to the dark side, went to three cybersecurity startups in order to learn how to build my own company. And I did it for six years period, three different cybersecurity companies. And almost three years ago, I started the journey of trust. So that's briefly my experience still today. Okay. So you have a co-founder, right? So the two of you, how did you two get together and meet and come up with this idea? So I'll divide the question to two, how we get together and second, how we found the problem. So first, one of the key areas that I decided that I need to find is someone that I really want to work in order to build a company. And my co-founder name is Eli Benun. I recruited him to the second startup that I worked in. And we are working together in the last almost eight years, I'm going to say. So that's how we got together. Now, when I called Eli and told him, look, we're going to build a company, there wasn't a question about it. The only question was what type of problem we're going to tackle. And, you know, after being in the cybersecurity for a long time, I wanted to do something else because first, cybersecurity is very crowded. 
But more to that, the narrative in cybersecurity, the narrative in sales is more about fear and less about value. I wanted to create something that I can really quantify and show real ROI to my customers. So when I was at the bank, I worked a lot in the Ford area. I did a lot of work here and I saw a lot of different cases. Some of them were from our corporate customers. Exactly those type of scenario that someone compromised their suppliers, they asked them to change the bank details, and at the end, they lost a big amount of money. So that's how I was familiar with that. And when we started to do ideation, I went back to that problem. And I realized two things. First, this problem became much bigger than I remember. And second, no one really solved it. So then we saw a couple of reports and we saw uh, one report claimed that by 2020, there was a reported loss of $32 billion. So we saw it. And then we're like, okay, but we really want to understand that that's a real problem. So we decided to do mark- our own market validation and we started to approach any CFO that was based in the US and was willing to spend some time with us. And in the first three months, we, was, we were able to speak with 150 CFOs. And it was an amazing journey because everyone told us that that's top priority for them and why money is scary. But more to that, they told us that what they do today is manual controls and processes, not technology at all. And 90% admit that they suffer a significant loss in the last two years. So that's really caused us to really do that. And that's how we really understand how big is their problem, what people do today. And that's why we took the approach that we took today. Okay. Okay. So what are some things you're passionate about? So maybe one business related passion and one personal passion. So business perspective, first, I really like to build things. So building company, it's a passion, but I always like to build things even with my hands. So my grandfather was a carpet now. So I did a lot of things with him until today. I like to do a cool own project with my kids. So that's a, one of the passion. Another passion is me. I like to smoke meat, so. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so if someone came to you, maybe they're looking for a job or right out of school, maybe they're changing careers and they say, hey, you're in this kind of payments fintech industry. It's growing. It's an industry I want to get into. What kind of advice would you give them to be successful? First, follow your dreams. And think big, don't just uh, put yourself to boundaries. And second, start doing something. Because at the end of the day, you can always think doing doing big, but you need to start from somewhere. So those will be the two advice. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think that uh, take action advice is huge for, for anybody. So we've covered a lot of ground already about you and the company and what you do and a little about you personally. So is there anything else you'd like to cover before we wrap up the show? I just want people to know that, especially in the finance world, there are better solution today than manual controls and processes. And you don't need to be afraid of from technology because technology can and should be your friend, but it doesn't need to replace you or anything like that. Well, I think that we need to be very, we are very lucky to live in those areas that we can really see a lot of changes and technology can serve a lot of needs. Okay, great. I think that's a great way to wrap up the show. So Shai, thank you so much for being here. I know your time is very valuable. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Doug. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well.